Teach Me to Code, episode 56. Hey everybody, and welcome back to the Teach Me to Code podcast. This is your host Charles Maxwood, and this week I'm going to be going. Uh, I'm going to have an interview that I did with uh, Tom Preston Warner. Uh, Tom is one of the co-founders of GitHub.com, and uh, he also created uh, Gravatar.com. And uh, he, we, we talked quite a bit about uh, entrepreneurship, and. We, we, we talked about a whole bunch of things. We talked about hiring. We talked about finding great developers, uh, how to recognize great developers, and, and really just a whole bunch of things that, that I'm really looking forward to uh, to sharing with you. So uh, we'll get into the interview in a minute, but before we get started, I want to remind you that this podcast is sponsored by New Relic. New Relic is one of the leading application management tools out there. It's a terrific tool, and uh, it, it it's just amazing in... Um, in, in what you can get from it, the, the information that you can gather on your application, find out what it's doing, find out what it's doing wrong, find out where you need to optimize it, and just things like that. So I highly, highly recommend that you go check them out. You can find them at newrelic.com, uh, or you can go to the website, and then if you look on the right, if you scroll down a little bit, um, you can actually find it under podcast sponsors. There's a link there, and we actually get a little credit if you use that link, so um, I, I would appreciate it if you went and did it that way, but... Either way, I, I, I really just want it to pay off for you, and uh, I want you to enjoy using the tool. So there you go. Um, now, I, I, I'm really excited for this interview, so I'm just going to jump into it. And uh, on the other end, then I'll, uh, I'll do some of the other stuff that I typically do at the beginning. All right. Have a good one. So, uh, are you at uh, GitHub headquarters right now, or are you somewhere else? I am indeed. I am in the podcast room. It's the only office that we have. Oh, really? <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I, I'm just going to go ahead and get started asking questions. Um, I actually uh, talked to you briefly at RubyConf after you talked about a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about today, um, and it, it really just intrigued me, and I, I wanted to kind of help or, or to get some of the story of GitHub out there so people know what it's about and how it got to where it is and things like that. So um, could you just give us kind of a brief history of how GitHub got started? Yeah. Uh, GitHub started as a side project. It really was just something fun that, that uh, Chris and I, Chris Wanstroth and I, started doing on the side. I had... Uh, sold my previous project, which was kind of a side project as well, Gravatar, to Automatic uh, in the middle of 2007. And I'm the kind of guy that always has a side project. And so I was looking for something to do. And uh, Git was starting to really become popular. Um, well, I shouldn't say popular, but it was starting to get some... some uh, there was starting to get some buzz around it in the Ruby community in San Francisco. Uh, one of my good friends, Dave Farum, who I worked with at PowerSet at the time, introduced me to it and said, hey, this, this thing, Git, it's like Subversion, only way more awesome, way more powerful. It has these branches that you can do really easily. It has, you can use it offline. You can commit when you want instead of uh, always having to worry about pushing it to the centralized server on every commit. You don't have to worry about breaking the build. All of these things, which were really sounded very nice, uh, and we started using it a little bit internally at PowerSet. And from there, we were big attendees of the, the Ruby meetups in San Francisco. And so we talk about Git there, and I believe the Rubinius project started using Git quite early. Uh, and so at, at these Ruby meetups, we'd always talk about it, and Chris uh, would be at the meetups as well. And we, we'd brainstorm ideas that we would have around how we could make Git easier to use. Because ironically, Git is this distributed version control system that is supposed to make it really easy to work together. And yet, at the time, there was no good way to share your Git repository on the internet. Uh -huh. You had to have a private server somewhere, and then you had to create user accounts, and you had to give people access to those accounts. And so you'd have repositories everywhere. And who wants to maintain their own private server just as a Git repository, and then there's not really any visibility into it. GitWeb was and still is kind of atrocious. 
<laughs> and so we we talk about how we could lever how we could really use the power of Git to make these social interactions and coding and working on open source way better. And we we tossed around all kinds of ideas during these meetups, and nothing ever seemed to to make any sense to me until. One day, Chris and I were at a bar after one of the, the meetups, which is where we always got. <laughs> that was always my favorite part, to go to the bar after the meetups. And that was where you could really talk about stuff with the people and, and where you really met people who were like you and, and loved talking about technology the most. And we got to talking about uh, building a, a site that was really just Git hosting. That was, that was the concept at the time. Two words, Git hosting. And, but really, it was Git hosting that was that was going to be nice to use in a web application format. There was there were some other uh, installations out there that tried to let you share code, but they were just awful. Very right. just very bad usability. Um, just not done in the with with any taste. Uh-huh. And we were both web developers, and I was looking for a new side project. And we started talking, and we said, "Well, how do we? What if we made a site for hosting Git repositories uh, that was not terrible?" And that's kind of how it started. And we just started working on it very soon after we had that conversation. And uh, really, it was just very basic at first. It was just a source code browser. You could push repositories, and then you could see the code online and see the commit history. And um, just very basic, just the, the most basic thing that you can imagine. And that's where it started. And we started, once we got there, then we said, okay, now we can use Git the way it should be used, which is to have really easy collaboration by just pushing a repository to an online service and then you're done. And then we started building all kinds of stuff around it Mm -hmm. in our free time, nights and weekends, which we did for about three months before we did the private beta. Uh, Got some Ruby projects on early, Merb being probably the very first uh, project uh, that had any kind of notoriety in the Ruby community. Uh, Yehuda Katz, was is user number four in the service, and he was the maintainer of Merb at the time. And he said, "This is really cool. I want to use this for Merb." And so he moved it over officially to to GitHub during the private beta, very very early. Oh, and that wow. was a, that was a huge help. So just knowing people in the Ruby community and going to those meetups, talking to them, and having some kind of user base that we could start getting on GitHub was really important in the early days. Super important, just to have that. To have some some user base to go to and say, "Hey, check this out. We think you might find this interesting." Huh. Okay. So uh, I have a few side projects, and you know, I, I think they're interesting things. But um, how do you go from side project to an actual business? H- how do you make that leap? Well, it took a long time. I think we the f- when uh, we worked on it as a side project for probably. Almost a year, eight months or so, uh-huh. without taking any salaries. I was working full time at PowerSet. Uh, Chris and PJ were doing uh, their own thing. They had Airfree, the blog that they were doing, and then um, they had their consulting business and they were building a product called FamSpam uh-huh. uh, at the time. And so they were working on that to pay the bills. Uh, and so we were all just making our money elsewhere. And then any money that we made from the site, we just put in the bank account. Right, and just let it build up so that we figured someday there will be enough money here and enough income to support us full time. Right. Hopefully, that was the dream. And so, really, it was just patience and working on it, it, it loving it enough to work on it in the few hours that we had after work, or well, I you know, few. <laughs> I probably <laughs> did two full time work days most days back then. Oh wow! During the creation, yeah, the build up of of GitHub originally. Huh. And on weekends and stuff, I was just I worked on it all the time, just all the time. Okay. Uh, so uh, it takes a lot of dedication. If you want to bootstrap, it, it took a lot of dedication. It took a lot of a lot of patience to just wait for the money to come in slowly. It mm-hmm. wasn't all of a sudden. Uh, it, it grew pretty pretty rapidly, but it takes a lot of money to pay three people's full time salary. Right. To a level that that we can live right because uh-huh. we've. We've, we have responsibilities now and we have uh, bills to pay. And, and so you have to have, when we started paying ourselves, we weren't making what we were accustomed to making. 
but we started lower, and then every month, if we hit a certain revenue target, then we would bump up our salaries. Okay. And then we had a cap that we were trying to reach somewhere that we thought that, that, was, that made sense. Uh-huh. Uh, and so we just worked towards that, and we had a schedule. Okay. Um, dang, I forgot what I was going to ask. Um, so it, it's something that's kind of grown into this huge... I, I can only imagine how, how big the application is, you know, how much it takes to run it. Um, what kind of scaling issues did you run into, and how did you solve them? Uh, scaling issues early were mostly with the shared file system that we were using at Engine Yard. That was just the customary thing that they did, and it didn't fit our situation very well because we were very heavy on I.O. Mm-hmm. And so um, the, this Red Hat GFS was not suitable for our use case, uh, and it was really that, w- that was what caused most of the, the issues early on was just hitting this shared file system with I think at the time we had 11 or so uh, slices uh, at Engine Yard. And uh-huh. GFS just did not scale to that many uh, endpoints with the kind of I.O. that we needed. So we fought a lot with that. And there, there were problems with something called fencing. Fencing is when one server fails. It needs uh-huh. to remove itself from the pool so that it doesn't hold locks on file system. Because this was a POSIX file system, uh-huh. POSIX compatible file system, so it would maintain locks on files and things like this. And that was really problematic when the fencing failed, which it constantly did, because of it's just really hard to configure that stuff. It's very yeah. complex. And so when, when one server would fail, it would basically take down the whole cluster uh-huh. until things were rebooted, and it caused a lot of downtime and a lot of headaches and a lot of stress for everyone involved. That's how and, we all got to know and love the Octocat, right? Yes, well... <laughs> The 500 page was was rather common back then, and that's that's mostly why uh, scaling the other stuff was easy. Rails Rails was never and still has never been a scaling problem. Okay. The data the database we started to stress it out at Engine Yard because it was rather small, um, and and so that but that was only because we were not able to get that. Um, on a, on a machine that we need that, to where it needed to be. It really uh-huh. needed to have a, a sizable amount of RAM and a, and a dedicated machine to do it. And we never got there. And so the, the database was only a problem because of that. Right. The, the database now is also not a scaling problem. Most of the data that we have is in Git repositories. Mm-hmm. Sense, right? We have around yeah. probably nine terabytes of Git repository data on disk. And the database... With the messaging table, I think clocks in at something like six hundred gigabytes. Huh. So it's 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 very and that's mostly the the notifications table, the messaging, right. just messages that you get when people do stuff, do network uh, repository operations. So that's probably eighty percent in that massive, huge messaging table. We're working on that right now to try and move that out of out of MySQL. We use MySQL for the database. What are you going to move it to? Uh, we well, we don't know yet. Uh, it's possible that primary storage could be in Redis mm-hmm. or React, possibly Cassandra. I don't know. We're working at we're we're just whiteboarding the new messaging system okay. right now. So it's it's unknown. Redis will uh, will definitely take a part in how you see your messages on mm-hmm. the website. Uh, the ones that you see in your dashboard will come from Redis. That's a project that Rick Olson is working on. Technoweenie. Right. Uh, he's working on something to put the messages that you see in your dashboard into Redis so that the lookup is incredibly fast. Uh-huh. And it just maintains a list of, of IDs to messages that it can pull really rapidly. Because pulling out those messages is not a trivial operation from a right. SQL database uh, with so much data in it. It's indexed and everything, and that's okay, but it's still a lot of queries. People hit their dashboard all the time. And so it generates a lot of queries against MySQL, which really don't need to be there because it's, it doesn't need to be that relational. It's uh-huh. not something that requires that level of, of uh, relationness. Okay. So uh, <laughs> it, it makes me think a little bit, and uh, I, had an, I remember the other question I was going to ask, but I'm going to ask this first. Um, where then are the trade-offs between having things be relational versus having them in some kind of document store or something like Redis? What are the trade-offs? Yeah, for between relationness and non-relationness, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's really just what does the problem want? 
do you uh-huh. need do you need relational stuff like with with users and rep- repositories and who's following who that kind of stuff is all very relational you want right. to be able to hit it with a single sql statement and get back all of the data that you need just all, at once mm-hmm. and so that problem set that problem wants a relational database and that's fine and then you've got other things like messaging which really don't need relational databases or the routing table that we have now the way that we solve the 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 file system issue was by creating a routing mechanism routed sh- Started file systems. So each file system is a separate pair of servers that are just Linux boxes with mm-hmm. attached fast disk. And then we have a routing system that tells the front ends where to go to get the information that they need. And that scales out. So far we have 10 pairs of those. And that can scale out basically forever. The wow. architecture we have right now, it, it will scale for a long time, limited only by availability of rack space at rack space. Wow. Uh, okay. so that's, and so that's a place where you don't need SQL for that. You would rather just have keys and values and say, where, what, what, what file system, what file server do I need to go to? You know, look up with a key and get a value back. And you have no need to do relational kind of work. Right. So the trade-off for me is really just what, what fits the problem domain. And we use Redis for all kinds of other stuff, too, things that fit the problem. It's also great for collecting statistics. Um, we use it for, I believe, recording um, whether messages are read or not. Because that, that kind of stuff, you don't need it to be relational. It just has to be quickly retrievable. Right. So right. we use both. And it's amazing. Having a, a relational database and then a, a, a key value like Redis. To me, MySQL and Redis or Postgres and Redis or whatever the hell you're using in Redis is kind of the perfect combo huh. of, of data stores. Redis is so good at so many different things. It has so many rich data types. Huh, I'll have to I'll have to look more at Redis. I, I've I've got a list of technologies I want to learn, and not enough time to pick them all up. So <laughs> yeah, we'll put Redis at the top because it's it is one of the most used pieces of infrastructure that we have. Okay, uh, it definitely, and I'll probably be uh, sending you emails and asking you questions about it. Um, sure. I've got another question for you, and this is more related to I guess the marketing or product design. Um, mm-hmm. When you started building GitHub. Um, you, how did you validate that people wanted something like GitHub, or did you just build it and then people started using it? We just built it for ourselves initially. We wanted it, and we said, well, we're web developers, let's build this, and then start using it for our own stuff. Really, we just wanted to be able to use it for ourselves. Uh-huh. I was working on a project called God, which is the process monitoring software for Ruby, and Chris was contributing some stuff back then, and we really wanted to, to move it into Git and use it in Git, which we were, and we were trying to use some other really crappy web thing that someone had for that, and it was terrible. It just was not the way that it needed to be. And so we just built it for ourselves so we could start using it and start using it the way that we wanted and build it out the way that we wanted with the features that we needed for the way that we worked with open source. Okay. And, and it turned out that other people wanted it too. And I had a notion that that would be true. I thought back then that I wanted to build out this, I wanted to build out GitHub on Git, and Git was, very not, was not very popular at all. Nobody was mm-hmm. using Git back then. The Linux kernel and a few random projects, Rubinius came on super early, uh, a few projects were using Git. But really, nobody knew about it. And a few people in the Ruby community knew about it, and almost nobody outside of it, unless they were in the Linux mm-hmm. kernel community, knew about it. And so I, I had a notion that it was going to be super popular because it was so much more powerful than Subversion. Mm-hmm. And I wanted GitHub to be there when that happened, when Git became popular. So I wanted to just get started early on it, build up stuff for when the time came. So I had a hunch that it would be that that would happen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it happened a lot faster than I thought it would. Okay, and that's largely due to the Ruby community coming over almost in its entirety within the first year of GitHub's existence. Rails came over when we launched publicly in April of '08, and immediately thereafter, it was just like an avalanche of Ruby projects. So yeah. that, that was very important. But we built it for ourselves initially with a hunch that other people would want it. And it turned out people did. People signed up uh, 
a lot and they really liked it. Mm-hmm. You, even the limited functionality that we had and, and mostly just due to the power of Git. They were like, well, Git gets us so many awesome things and then you layer GitHub on top of that and now it truly is a social application for collaborating on code and nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually heard about it on uh, like uh, twit.tv and stuff and, and other podcasts and, and tech discussions where they're talking about open source and and they'll mention something in open source, and inevitably it comes back to, oh, well, you can go check it out on GitHub. And <laughs> it, it, it's really become kind of this, uh, um, I, I, it's just been a community, more than a community thing. It, it's become synonymous with open source in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'm, I'm every day, I'm flabbergasted at how much awesome stuff people are putting on GitHub. And that people are really using it the way that we envisioned. Mm-hmm. And, and the features that we're putting out there, people are finding valuable and, and using them in ways that we didn't even imagine a lot of them. I mean, that's, mm-hmm. I think, the beauty of building something simple that people can then build upon and having an API. People build all kinds of stuff with the API as well. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's important. And offering it free for open source, that wasn't something that, that was, we talked about that a lot. That was not a natural, that didn't just come to us. We had mm-hmm. long discussions about how to do pricing. And we decided that making it free for open source was going to be, well, first of all, open source people weren't going to pay for it. So right. um, that kind of made it an easier decision. But certainly people have tried to charge for open source stuff before. Mm-hmm. And it just, it, it made sense to us from the beginning to make it free for open source because we ourselves were big open source people and we use all kinds of open source. And that's such an amazing way to contribute back to mm-hmm. the open source community by helping people make open source easier, what better way could we have of contributing back to that world that we that that has given us so much? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I I wholeheartedly agree, and it's it's really interesting too just to see what projects wind up on GitHub that you can go and check out that, that people are working on. Um, you actually have several projects if you go look at your GitHub account that are fairly interesting. Uh, you mentioned God. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm also curious about Jekyll and, and what kind of prompted that. Um, it's something that I ran across recently, and if you've used any of the big monolithic uh, blogging engines like WordPress or, or uh, TypePad or any of those, I mean, you know, they've got 10 million features. You only ever use about five. And, <laughs> you know, it, it's really, it, it's almost cumbersome to use some of them or to try and figure out the right way to do certain things with them. So I'm, I'm a little curious as to uh, you know how you conceived of Jekyll and uh, what you use it for. Uh, yeah, so for anyone that doesn't know, Jekyll is a static site generator that's, that's blog aware. And by that I mean if you write files in a certain format and give them a certain title and put them in a certain directory, then they will be, they will be converted into a directory structure that looks like a, a web log. And the reason that I wrote it was because I was tired of moving from server to server with my blog, with my WordPress blog. I've been writing a web blog since probably 2002-ish, 2003. And I've moved it quite a bit because I'm sort of fussy about my web blog and I change domains. And, and, and over, the, over the years, I had different interests and had different blogs. And most of them, I've just they've they I've, they've I've lost them. They're they're gone. Mm-hmm. Everything that I wrote is gone, because I failed to back up some private server I had somewhere properly, or do a MySQL dump of the database, or export it to a to a format that I wanted, and then I kind of forgot about it because I I went off of that certain the specific that specific blog, and but then later on, years later, I would love to have that data. I would love to have those. And I know that I never will. And that's just sad. And I want, and so I wanted something that worked more the way that I do as a developer because I don't lose code. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, I lose my web blog somehow, but I don't lose code. So what if I could write my blog like I write? I could write articles in Markdown in my editor locally and and then push them somewhere and it would automatically publish the blog. What if I could do that? That would be pretty awesome. And so I sat down one day and I just wrote the simplest thing that I could imagine that would accomplish that. It was not very long at all. 
it wasn't much code and it was really just based around that concept right mm-hmm. blogs as markdown or textile or whatever i was using at the time and convert them uh to a static site that i could then just push either manually push up to a web server just apache or nginx or whatever right mm-hmm. doesn't matter uh, and then I'd be done. And wouldn't it be even cooler if I could set up something to where if I pushed it to a server, then it would just trigger a post receive that would run Jekyll on the server side and convert it for me. And that's that's what I wanted to build. And that's, that is what I built originally just to solve my own blogging problem because I hadn't been blogging in a year or something because I was too depressed about losing my data and it was just a pain in the ass. I didn't like writing... It in the it, putting in all the values in a in a web application like WordPress. WordPress is great for a lot of things, but it just did not serve my need. And so I wrote Jekyll. And then through a, a bit of serendipity, we were at the same time working on the GitHub Pages functionality for GitHub, which would allow you to just upload static HTML to a repository, and then we would publish it. That was kind of the concept. And that's another thing that in retrospect seems so obvious, the way that it's done, that at the time we had heated discussions for days about how that would work. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, where would that go? Would it go in a subdomain? Would it, become, would it go on a different domain altogether? Would it, would it be just HTML? Would there be some kind of converter based behind it? How would we deal with the security issues? I mean, there were a million different things that we talked about in creating it. And and one of them in the, one of the discussions came up. Well, wouldn't it be nice if you could use this for writing a weblog? And now, yes, there are there were existing static site generators. One of them was called uh, Webby, I think, which I was playing around with at the time. Didn't feel intuitive to me. That was another reason I wrote Jekyll was because I, Webby was not it was, did not gel in my mind right. the way that I wanted it to. And then, it, and then it came up to say, well, what if we use this Jekyll thing that I'm writing, which was very primitive at the time. But it was a way to write a static site using – you can use liquid templating to do fancy things and get variables included and, and tell it how to format stuff. Mm-hmm. And it was able to be written in a way that was secure. So we could run it on our, on our servers and not have to worry about arbitrary code execution, right. which obviously is important. <laughs> Just a little. <laughs> uh, yes, a little important. And so it, uh, it was It was something that I was writing that we could control, that we could guarantee that it was going to be secure and that we wouldn't allow certain types of things that would make it insecure and, we, and, and it accomplished that need. And we said, okay, well, let's include Jekyll functionality because a static site by itself is also a valid Jekyll site just by virtue of being static stuff. Right. You run it through Jekyll, and it's just a no-op, basically. It just copies right. everything over directly. Anything that doesn't have YAML in the header, in the top part, mm-hmm. just gets copied over verbatim. Hmm. Uh, and, so, and so it turned out that that was a really good fit for the GitHub Pages functionality. And so we launched with that, and that, that has driven a huge amount of, of the popularity of Jekyll, that Jekyll has, just because people can use it for pages, and they know that. And so... Uh, it's a really nice way to get stuff published on the internet for free and really easily. And so that was, that was huge. Without that, it would probably still be a rather small project. Right. That makes sense. Um, so we, we've talked about God and we've talked about um, uh, Jekyll. I, I'm also interested in Tom Doc. And, and the reason that I'm interested in Tom Doc is because um, our spec, or our spec, our, our doc, it's our doc, and Yard. They, yep. I, I've seen them both. I've tried them both. Um, if I use one, I typically use RDoc because it's included in everything with Ruby. But it, it seems like a lot of noise to me. And and even after I uh, use it to generate the web pages, the web pages are ugly. And and you know. And so I ran across TomDoc, and I, I haven't seen it in action. But I, I'm kind of curious because one thing that appealed to me with it was that it looked nice in in the text. Like mm-hmm. you know, above my uh, my method, and so I'm I'm a little curious as to where things are with that, and if it's out there where people can use it. Yeah, well, the the goal of TomDoc is to be a documentation designed for humans and not for machines. It's optimized for humans who are writing code to read that documentation and know what the code is doing. Mm-hmm. Everything else is secondary, so there's still not any reasonable. 
uh, parser for it, like RDoc and Yard have, that will mm-hmm. give you output in a really nice way. It's certainly doable, but it would be more it would be more freeform than you would find with Yard. One of Yard's goals is to be very, very unambiguous about mm-hmm. parameters and things. The problem being with Ruby, Ruby is an ambiguous a language that is built for ambiguity and for all kinds of shenanigans, and it's really hard to document in a rigorous way. Right. And the the philosophy of TomDoc is that that's okay. You just write your documentation in prose. So mm-hmm. that people understand what it is, and and here's where our doc I think goes terribly wrong, in that it provides you formatting information for your documentation, so you can say, oh, this should be in teletype font, or this should be, this is a file name, or whatever. Right. But that's who cares? I don't care. I don't care about formatting when I'm writing documentation. I care about clarity and getting information mm-hmm. across and saying what types things are expecting as parameters and what types things are expecting to be returned and some examples. And so that's what TomDoc is. TomDoc is, is almost as much a philosophy of documentation as it is a specification for doing it. Mm-hmm. Really, it's designed to take the, the guesswork out of how to write docs, which is to say, uh, a good set of documentation for a function, or specifically, and classes are, are a subset of that, is to say, describe what the thing is doing, describe what the function is doing, describe what each parameter is doing, and what type it expects. And you can be loose about saying that. You could say, oh, it expects uh, this parameter should be an object that responds to whatever. Right. That is really hard to specify in a rigorous way without a huge mm-hmm. amount of learning syntax. And, and so, and so TomDoc says, that's fine. Just describe what it does. Right. Just tell me what the desired behavior is or the desired type is or what the various circumstances are. I don't care about rigorous, unambiguous specifications with at symbols and all that crap. I don't care. This is not designed for a machine to read. It's designed for me to read while I'm going through the code in my code editor trying to figure out what the hell the code is doing. Right. Because that's where I am when I'm reading code. I'm in the code, mm-hmm. not in some separate documentation thing. The, the code, the documentation of, of a code, of a file of code should be designed for the developer who's contributing, not for someone who's casually looking over the API trying to figure out what method to call. Right. You write a separate doc for that. There should be separate docs for that that are optimized for mm-hmm. understanding the code base from that direction. Right. And it would be very much than just ripping a bunch of docs out of the functions in a, in a, in a file and then presenting to the, to the user. That's not the correct way to do that. Mm-hmm. So Tom Duck says, show me, tell me what it's doing, describe the parameters, uh, show me some examples, and then tell me what it returns or what it raises. Right. And that's pretty much it. And it's very human readable. It is designed to be optimally readable by a human. It's still, it, the specification, is, it, it tries to be specific about how you should write each thing. Mm-hmm. So there's some kind of um, regularity to the way that people write that kind of documentation. But it's loose enough to where you don't necessarily have to obey it right, all right. the time. Nothing's going to break if you if you screw something up. That's okay. fine. As long as it's as long as it's as long as it's just easy to to understand. So that's TomDoc. I've been writing documentation that way for several years uh-huh. without formalizing it. Uh, I started with the RDoc syntax and just changed it to be how I thought it should look uh-huh. for me to understand it later on. And then at GitHub, we said, well, let's formalize this and make this the way that we write documentation for internal GitHub projects. And, for, and a lot of us use it now for our open source stuff externally. And so we uh, formalized it. I, along with Chris and, and some of the other guys here, really banged out the syntax, changed it a little bit from what I was doing, made it better, formalized it, um, covered some of the problems that it had, some of the limitations, and then released it as a specification. And, and that's, I, there's a long way to go with TomDoc. It's not mm-hmm. where I want it to be. And pretty much nobody's using it but us, as far right. as I can tell. Uh, and mostly that's because it just requires some attention in evangelizing, which I'm going to start doing with it. And a, a nice formatter would be, would be great to have because people, while, while I think that it's primarily for reading in the code, people do enjoy seeing it in a nicely formatted way, mm-hmm. whatever. It's not a, it's not a high priority yeah. for Really, but people do like seeing that, and I think that could help its adoption. 
just to ease people through the transition to say, okay, well, if it doesn't have automatic generation to HTML, then it's useless to me. Well, <laughs> maybe I can get them on board by giving them that, and then later on, uh-huh. they'll be like, oh, I'm just reading this in the code. I don't need to generate this as external documentation, really. Well, I think it would be interesting, too, to see how many people actually fire up the RDoc or whatever, the HTML page, and look at the docs. Because I'll tell you, I, uh, when I was newer to, to Ruby, I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, I need to generate the docs, and then I'd fire them up to make sure they looked right. But that was the only reason I ever opened them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, I mean, it was it really just boiled down to, okay, well, you know, I just want to get an idea of what this does in the code. And it it came down to, okay, well, if I go, if, even if I just put good inline comments, you know, that, that it, to me is more valuable than having this thing generate, you know, this formatted HTML. So... Yeah, really, really interesting, and I think I think you know you're on the right track with that. Um, I'm a little curious then how you plan on evangelizing it. Um, that that's one thing that's interesting about open source that I don't think we hear a lot about. Uh, the well, I haven't thought about it that much. I'm going to start talking about it at conferences. That okay. will be my probably my primary way. I'm going to write more about it on my blog and try and get it on Hacker News and stuff like that, so people can see it more. Uh, I don't know. Tweet about it. I have my ways. <laughs> I have my ways. It'll it'll take time. Something like that takes a long time. I mean, Yard, yeah. Yard is now pretty popular, but it's taken what four years? Yeah, something like get that. Where it yeah. is. So it's a slow procedure. People are, are are reticent to change the way that they write something like Docs, and it's a huge pain in the ass to convert what you're doing now to something else. Oh yeah. So really, the only way that new documentation styles can come into effect is through new projects. Right. And that's and so I'll I'll just be working on it for the next rest of my life trying to, <laughs> trying to get people to understand the way that I think about that kind of documentation and and talking about the difference between in code function and method documentation and how that should be different from a, external API documentation mm-hmm. for users and how that's different from a book style documentation that really introduces someone to the entire thing. This is something that Jacob Kaplan Moss talks about too in his in some talks that he gives. He's one of the main guys on on um uh crap, Django. And he talks a lot about documentation. And their documentation uh-huh. is, is great because they understand the difference in the audience between those three types of things. Right. Uh, very high level introduction, tell me why this is useful and then tell me how to use it in a practical way. Uh-huh. API reference, which is all of the externally usable chunks of the code that you want to call, right? The public API right. of this pro- of the project, just uh-huh. in a reference format. Tell me what that. Tell me what that reference. You tell me what what the different things that I might want to call are. Uh huh. And then third, in in file documentation of functions. Uh huh. And so maybe maybe there's a way to do that with encode for if you have a defined public API mm-hmm. uh, and this is another goal that TomDoc has which is identify which parts of your code are the, are the public API right. is, this, is this function designed to be called as part of the API from an external user uh-huh. and so those descriptions start with public colon just in, mm-hmm. the, in, just in the top that way, you're reading the code, and you come across a, a method that is public. Well, you know that you better not mess with that too much because people are relying on that as part of the public API. Right. And if you change it too much, then according to semantic versioning, another one of the things that I'm trying to work on and evangelize, if you change that public API to be backwards and compatible, you have to rev the major version. And you don't want to rev the major version unless you absolutely have to. Right. And so knowing that something is public right in the documentation, that it's intended for public consumption through a public API, you, you need to see that in the code so that you can be very careful with that method signature. Uh-huh. Uh, and so that's another part of it. And just evangelizing it through maybe an automated tool that went through and took all of the, public, all of the things that were marked public uh-huh. and showed you that documentation, okay, that might be useful. Right, right. That could potentially be very useful. Especially when you think about when you release another version, you could essentially just diff the methods that have changed uh, for the public that are marked as public, 
mm-hmm. and show people and say, hey, this method is new. This method has been removed. This method has had its signature changed or it's, it's been updated to be clearer. Uh-huh. So that if you're using a project and there's a new minor release comes out, it's really hard to know whether you should upgrade or not. Right, right. If you were able to, or whether it's safe to upgrade, especially if people aren't using semantic versioning, mm-hmm. to know, for, to tell them whether it's backwards compatible or not. Seeing in the documentation, in the public API, what has changed specifically would give you a really easy way to know if it's safe or reasonable or desirable to upgrade to that new version. Mm-hmm. So that's another, that's another pipe dream of TomDoc, is to allow automated uh, knowledge around what has changed and what the, pub, what the public API is. Uh, right. That's all baked into the specification. Yeah, I think one thing yeah. that is the nice about what... I'm getting a little bit of echo here. Is that better? Um, yeah, a little yeah. bit. Anyway, so one thing that I think is interesting about uh, documentation like RDoc or Yard or TomDoc when it's in line like this is that it does give you something to search on. So if I'm looking for how do I do X or Y in you know in this project, then I can search for the keywords describing what I want to do, and you know it'll it'll bring up the methods that are involved in that. And so that's something that's kind of nice, and I, I like the examples that the you know, or provided. Uh, I saw that in TomDoc in the specification you had, Mm -hmm. you know, and I really like that where it's like, if you want to do this, then, you know, you make this call and you get this result. And, um, you know, that's another thing that I think is really interesting because, you know, ultimately, if you're writing your documentation so that people know what the method does, to me, that seems backward from, you know, if you want to do this, then you need to call this method. Because typically, if I'm looking at a library I'm not familiar with, that's what I want to know. I want to know, how do I do X with Y rather than what does this method do? Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are all really difficult problems that yeah. that I that I don't even know the answers to, right? Mm-hmm. But I feel like t- something like TomDoc that is more focused on the user, the the reader, mm-hmm. than it is on the machine, which is what everything else feels like it's trying to do, and that's formalized in a way that people don't have to think so much about what they should have in their documentation. That will at least give us a framework to try and figure out some of those more difficult questions. All right. So I'm going to change tactics a little bit and talk about um, your, your business again. And what I'm curious about here is that it seems like you've been able to attract some of the, the bigger names in Ruby, you know, some, some talent that people recognize. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, what do you think it is that you do that draws them in and gets them excited about your project? Uh, I think a lot of it is the way, the way that we work is, is kind of special and unique, I think. Uh, uh, we're a very flat organization. We've basically created the company as how how we would build a company that we ourselves want to work for. Mm-hmm. And that means mainly hiring really top-notch, smart, driven people and letting them work on what they think is best. Right. So we don't have managers. We don't have meetings. Uh, we don't have work hours or work days. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't have editory work from the office. Uh, you can work from wherever you happen to be. Uh, we don't have set vacation plan, so you want time off, you know, you go do that. It's about being responsible as a as a employee and being part of a team that's trying to really kick ass. So, mm-hmm. What we like to say is that we like to hire people and let them kick ass. Give them a, a framework and the, the 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 tools and and what they need to kick ass because that's what we love doing as developers uh-huh. right i mean good developers like to write great code that has an impact on the world oh yeah and so we try to make that as easy as possible for people to do and it means that we we can only hire a certain type of person that right. is that is capable of working in that way and that's something that we are going to begin to struggle with as we grow we're 29 employees now and so far, this, this method has worked, and it's allowed us to attract really top talent because that's what they want. They want to uh-huh. know that they're making a difference, and GitHub is something that a lot of developers use. So it, it's our peers are the ones that are telling us whether we're doing well or not, uh, and it's nice to be part of that community. We, get the, we, are, we ourselves are users, uh-huh. making it that much easier to know whether what we're doing is, is correct or not. Uh, and developers want to, to be... To feel like they're 
that, that they have control over their own destiny, really. Right. Really, over their own stuff. So while we discuss constantly the stuff that we're doing, uh, th- mostly through the campfire room that we have, where we have several campfire rooms. We use 37 Signals Campfire for our chat. Right. And we've used that since very early. And it's just from when there was just three of us to now there's 29. Well, all 29 of us are in the campfire, are in campfire whenever we're working. Mm-hmm. Pretty much. And that allows us to, to know what's going on in the company without, without having constant meetings. Right. Uh, you just go, there, there's one room that we call the serious room, which is basically for serious discussions, mm-hmm. uh, technical things. And then there's another room called the danger room, which is for hang, just hanging out, talking about whatever. <laughs> and we, and we, have, uh, we, we have a lot of other fun things that allow us, I think, to, to have a, the culture that people want to work for. Things like we've developed this campfire bot called Hubot, which is, can do a lot of things. He sits in the campfire room, and he, he basically responds to commands. So mm-hmm. we can say, Hubot, image me, and then a, a string. Uh, so if I were to say, Hubot, image me, um, tornado, then uh-huh. he would go and he would fetch one of the first eight results from Google Images for the, str- for the search tornado <laughs> and paste one of them in, right? <laughs> very, simple, very simple thing, but it really it changes how we work because it allows us to, to, be, to, be, to have fun. Right. And that's just, that's just the beginning. Uh, Hubot can also do things like tell you the weather. So you can say, Hubot, weather me, San Francisco. And then he will respond with, uh, with a graph of the next five days, just uh-huh. a kind of a tide graph of the next five days. That's something that I wrote because I wanted it. Uh, you can say, Hubot, office me. And he will look to see what MAC addresses are connected to the, to the office um, network. And, uh-huh. and show you the, the gravitars of the people who are currently in the office. Huh. Uh, and, and a million other things. Uh, goofy things and also serious things like Hubot. Uh, you can say Hubot load FE. And that means tell me the load across all of the servers that are the front end machines. Right. So if something is freaking out on a front end or someone's complaining about slowness somewhere, we can just say Hubot load or, or Hubot load FE or Hubot load FS and get back the, the loads on all of the machines, right, from Campfire. Uh, we can even run commands from there. We, can, we do deploys. We do a lot of our deploys through Campfire now mm-hmm. by just saying Hubot deploy GitHub to production. And uh, that's really kind of cool because it means that anyone in the company can deploy code without having to have direct access to the servers. Wow. So a lot of our designers deploy that way. Uh, that's the only way that they can deploy because they don't have mm-hmm. the keys necessary to access the servers. They don't want that kind of access. They would prefer, a lot of people prefer not to have direct access and it's, right. it's better for us because it limits the, the exposure of sensitive data to only key personnel. Uh-huh. Uh, and we do, we do so much. We used to have, you used to be able to make bets through Hubot. Um, <laughs> he keeps track of who answers the door. Uh, we have this thing, uh, you can say Hubot door me and he'll, he's hooked up to an Arduino, a little uh-huh. Arduino Wi-Fi thing to the door buzzer. And so you can buzz the outside door from Hubot without having to get up. <laughs> and he keeps track, he keeps track of who, who wins, who's, who's, uh, caught the buzzer the most. So the, it's just, there's, and, and that's just a few of them. The, and, and what's great about it, and the reason that I talk about this so much, is that this really reflects the culture that we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love having fun, but we love writing really awesome code. Uh, and Hubot is a way for us to have a project that anyone can contribute to that's not mission critical, that's, right. not, that's not GitHub itself, because we have to be very careful about what goes into GitHub. We have a, a lot of discussions, have, have code reviews, Make sure there's not going to be performance issues for new things that go in. It's just it's a lot of work to work mm-hmm. on GitHub, and it's nice to have an outlet uh, for experimenting with code that's fun, that gives people pride of ownership of working uh, on that and being the owner of that functionality in Hubot. Uh-huh. And it's written in Node.js, so it's a well. You just froze there. I don't know if you can hear me. I think we might have lost Tom here. Here, you there? We have a snafu there. Yeah. <laughs> the 
technical difficulties. Yeah. It's it's uh, interesting that you talk about that though, because a lot of the things that you're talking about with the general job are, are a lot of the reasons why I actually went freelance. Um, you know, I, I didn't feel like I had control. In fact, it was it was brought directly to my attention when I got laid off. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, I mean, the thing is, is yeah, we were always working on these uh, these other things. Some of them interesting, most of them not. And you know, yeah, you have very little control. Um, you don't get to work necessarily with the most talented people. And, yeah, a lot of the things you're talking about, you know, would almost seriously tempt me into going back and getting a job if I could work at a place like that. But it's it's interesting that, uh, you know, that that's the way it is, that everybody's involved, everybody understands what's going on. And, you know, yeah, th there's that outlet. There was a lot of similar things that that uh, you were talking about to when I worked at Mosey back when they were just an early, early startup. Uh -huh. um, they had an IRC channel, and we all we had an IRC bot that everybody hacked on, and you know it was kind of the same thing. You know, it, it Campfire allows you some things that IRC doesn't. I mean, you can't post an image to the chat and things like that. But yeah, yeah. you know, it it was the same kind of thing, and you had these goofy things like uh, you know our bot. I think came with a Chuck Norris thing, and so you would you know if anyone said anything with Chuck in there, then right. it, it would respond with the Chuck Norris quote. Which typically meant that any conversation that was going on with me, since my name's Chuck, elicited <laughs> Chuck Norris over and over and over and over again. But, you know, yeah, it was, it was those kinds of things that made it a fun place to work. And, uh, you know, people were invested. People built um, all kinds of stuff. I mean, one guy, he figured out how to um, basically pull people's backups down because they do online backup. Pull all their backed up data down, burn it to a disk, and he automated the whole thing. Yeah, you know, and just stuff like that. Was it something that somebody specifically asked for? No, but it was something that you know he had a little time and he worked on. You know, um, that's actually how I got into programming. I was running the tech support team at the time, and um, we needed a tool to help us manage some of our workload, and so I started coding on it, and that was perfectly acceptable for me to do that. You know, it added value to the company. It wasn't something that was mission critical, at least not for the first few months. And, right. you know, it, it did. It made a huge difference. Yeah, so. I, I think that's, that, that stuff is really important. So just the freedom to, to decide what is the most important thing to work on through good discussions and through valuing good arguments. Uh -huh. uh, there's another thing that we like to say about the company is that we are the company of the compelling argument in that it doesn't matter what your status here is or how long you've worked here. All that matters is are you making a good argument and are, are you making – can you back it up? Uh, so when, when someone says we should do it this way and another person says no, we should do it this way, well, whoever has the better argument wins. It's right. not about seniority. It's not about a manager coming in and putting his foot down. It's not about any of those things. It's about what is most logical. Uh -huh. And that keeps, us, that keeps us able to work in a really kind of great way. Mm -hmm. And just giving the developers, we have the company's 29 people that's comprised of 25 developers, two, two well, I mean, the designers even do development. But I would say two designers that are, that are more design than development. Uh -huh. uh, two, two support people. Uh, and then Melissa, our uh, operations administrator person who does all of the everything to keep us sane. Right. And that's it. That's really what we are. That's the demographic of the company. Oh, and we have one salesperson. So I guess it's 24. Well, whatever. You can figure out the numbers for yourself. But that's uh, he's a sales engineer. He comes from a development background. So we are a, a very, very heavily uh, developer centric company. There's not there's not. Uh, any overhead of people who are just making decisions. The people who are making the decisions are the people who are writing the code. Right. So I'm curious then, who in your company typically has the most compelling argument? Is it you or is it somebody else? <laughs> well, it's everybody. I mean, that's the, that's the beauty of it is that whoever is closest to the code and can make the best arguments. And sometimes it comes down to who, is, who's, who owns the code, who's writing the code. Well, they get the last, they're the decision maker. We have a culture of, of taking good arguments into account. Sometimes uh -huh. both sides have good arguments and someone just has to make a decision. The great thing about the web is that we can often correct our mistakes without right. a lot of uh, hassle. But having a culture of respecting arguments and instead of things like seniority 
and uh-huh. and other things that that are really easy traps to fall into. We just foster that culture, and everybody knows that just by being here. Uh-huh. And and then whoever owns the code, whoever's the cheerleader or the main person on a project, they'll make the final decision. It, it's rare that it comes to one of the founders to have to make a decision. Right. On certain things. Sometimes it does. And that's what we're here to do that. Sometimes uh-huh. those decisions have to be made just to, to get something going right. when, there's, when, it's, when there is no argument that is the clear winner. Uh-huh. Sometimes you just have to make a decision and then see what happens. Fine. Right. We, we do that too. But uh, as much as possible, we put the, the power into the hands of the, the developers. And that's, that's allowed us to attract great people because they know that's how we work. And they know we have fun. And they know we value code and value people and, and let people do what they need to do and as adults. We don't treat, treat, people, we don't treat people like children here. There's, no, there's none of that. <laughs> and that's kind of a shocking thing when you've come from the corporate world. I worked yeah. in the corporate world for a long time. And it's not any fun. It gets really old. So yeah. just giving people and not having departments or titles. Titles just trap people into thinking that they should be responsible for a single thing. Right. Not having titles allows people to bounce around between all kinds of different stuff. We're, we're very talented people here, and talented people want to expand their horizons and work on stuff that's new and experiment in one area and then experiment in another area. Uh-huh. And, that's, and that's, that should be okay, and we make that okay. That's, that's awesome. Honestly, that, that is just awesome. So you make it sound like it's, well, it's pretty flat. It's not completely flat. How much time do you spend running the company versus actually coding and, and doing this, the tech stuff that you're good at? Uh, it, it depends. It's gotten more towards the business side of things recently. Uh-huh. I'm doing a lot, of, a lot of conferences and a lot of traveling and a lot of dealing with um, customers and coordinating with Rackspace for servers and this kind of stuff. So I certainly don't code as much as I used to, although I'll have a, a stint every once in a while where I'll get a good couple of weeks done on a, on a project. Like if I sit down and I want to build a library, like I did not, not long ago or late last year, I wrote, I wrote the beginning parts of Gollum, which is the Get Back wiki that we have now mm-hmm. that, that runs the wikis on GitHub. Uh-huh. I wrote almost all of the initial code uh, for that within a span of a couple of weeks. And so it's, it's, it's nice for me to be able to do that, to really just hunker down and when I get into a project that's, that's well defined and I spec it out I write the readme the way that I want it to look and then I sit down to code it then I can, I can get some really serious work done that way mm-hmm. uh, but it's, it's happening less uh, and it's it, it, I start to feel weird if I haven't coded properly <laughs> in a while you know if I've been in, the, if I've been in, in Gmail more than I've been in Vim I start to get antsy you know <laughs> And I feel that way a little bit right now, honestly. I've been working on the search stuff for GitHub, and I need to get in there and really just figure it out because Solar is being a pain in the ass. No, that's, but that's it's, a, <laughs> I don't know. it's it's a it's I try to stay, I, I try to strike a balance, mm-hmm. and it is our it's our responsibility as the founders to make sure the business and stuff is going well, so that other people don't have to worry about it and they can just get their coding done. And so right. we are we are the shields, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, well, that protect people from that all that BS that we have to do. That makes sense. I have I have two more questions that I want to ask, and then we'll wrap this up. Um, well, in any discussion that we have related to that, but the first one is is you mentioned that you uh, on some of your projects you spec it out, you write the readme, and then you write in the code. Is that mm-hmm. generally the process you follow? And did I skip anything or oversimplify anything? Uh, that's the process that I try to follow, and I think. Uh, a lot of us here are starting to do that more and more. I wrote an article called Readme Driven Development, which mm-hmm. talks very specifically about that process. I find it really beneficial to have some kind of sp- specification, not like a formal giant document, but right. just writing the, what you want the code to look like from an API standpoint. Uh-huh. Like, what are you going to use? When you use this library, what, are you, what, what code are you writing to interact with it? Right. And that gets you through a lot of the problems that you would be facing later if you just started with the code. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I, and I find that writing it in the form of a readme works especially well because you have to think about it also from a, from a user's standpoint coming to it for the first time and specifying things especially I talk mostly from the, from the aspect of uh, infrastructure pieces of infrastructure so libraries uh-huh. stuff like servers and, and routing mechanisms and stuff like that uh, writing them 
with as the README first and thinking about them as if you were going to open source them, even if we're not. Uh-huh. We open source as much as we can, but certain elements just don't make sense to open source. It would be pointless. Right. Uh, if take, facing them from the point of assuming that they're going to be open sourced allows you to formalize them in a way that is generic so that they can be reused for other stuff later that you haven't even thought about. Uh-huh. And that's really important. De- decoupling them, modularizing and decoupling code that is infrastructure is one of the most important things that, that, I, that I want to do here. And I think we've done a really good job of it so far. Our infrastructure is all very modular. Most of it is open sourced. And thinking about it that way lets us keep it decoupled and modularized. And so that's starting from a README lets you, lets you, be, lets you do that more easily than okay. getting in there and just being like, oh, well, we needed to do this. So I write it this way. And then you don't think about how you're going to use it from a generic standpoint and how someone else might use it later on. So, uh, so that's the way we start. And then we go in and we do... Everyone works the way that they work best. So we don't do, some people pair program, most people don't. Uh, some people test drive religiously, other people are a little bit looser about it. I mean, we, having good test coverage is really important to us, but we're not so ruthless that we make people use a specific paradigm. Again, it's about personal responsibility and just owning what you, what you write. Mm-hmm. And so after that, people just work in the way that they work best, whatever that is for them. That makes sense. So I, I'm curious then, do you hold open source software that you use to kind of the same standard uh, related to the things that you're trying to accomplish with your, your process there? Well, what do you mean? Hold them to the same standard how? So I'm, I'm a little curious as to what in your mind makes a good open source project. Um, you know, is it is it the documentation? Is it the the test coverage, is it, you know, some of the other things that you're trying to achieve with your own software, or is there a different criteria for evaluating open source software, especially good open source software? Uh, yeah, the criteria that we use, a lot of it is what other people's experiences are. Mm-hmm. That's, that's one way that you can judge a piece of software without having, to, having used it yourself yet. Mm-hmm. So that's obviously big. Uh, Red, like that was really important for Redis. We started using Redis when it was very young still. And we were not 100% sure that it was going to work out. But we took a gamble and we said, well, let's give it a shot, see how it holds up. And it held up really well. And, it, and it, so far, the upgrade path has been really good. We've been very lucky that that, uh, that, it, that, that, that software is so good mm-hmm. because it is a hugely important part of our infrastructure. I think there's, there's so many things that go into it. It's hard to say, right? There's mm-hmm. community stuff. There's documentation stuff. There's how good is the maintainer? Uh, is progress being made? Are they, are they making the project better instead of worse? Right. Because projects get worse over time instead of better. You've got to have someone who's selective about what goes in. Uh-huh. A lot of these decisions are a matter of taste. What, what are your values? What do you value? Should you be, add, be, be adding everything or should it be much more specific and lightweight? And we need people who are doing both sides of those things. And so it's, it's nice sometimes to find someone who's focused on making something really streamlined and lightweight instead of something that solves every possible problem. Right. And then, and then making sure the documentation is good enough that you can figure out how to use it without having to go read the source code. Because I honestly don't want to go read the source code most of the time. <laughs> I, I, will, I am forced to do that quite a bit. But it's easier for me to have a higher level introduction right. to something than to have to go and read the source code to figure out what methods I can call to, to, to do something. And that's where a good public API comes in and what TomDoc is trying to accomplish. Uh, so there's just there's a million different things. And, and honestly, it's hard, to, it's hard to sit down and, and formalize what they are. It's, a lot of it's just the feel of it. All right. So my other question is, because I, I think there was a lot there that, that I think is, you know, is really relevant. But yeah, I mean... You know, in a lot of these cases, it's not something that you want to go dig into. It's just something that you want to work. And so, yeah, if you have a good experience, then you'll keep using it. And if it doesn't work for you or it doesn't work with your, your coding style or workflow, then you don't use it. That yep, makes sense. Exactly. A lot of it's just experiential, right? Yeah. It's, it's how, how does it, you start using it, and either it's awesome and it's do, solving all your problems, or it's not. And then you, you ditch it and you go try and find something else, or you end up writing your own, which we also do a fair amount. Right. Um, one other question that I have is, and it's related to the discussion that we had about attracting ca- good talent, is how do you recognize them? So I'm sure you have a million people that would love to work for GitHub. So, so how do you weed them out and decide, okay, you know, th- this guy is another Rick Olson and this guy's not? 
Uh, a lot of it is whether we know them already, personally. Mm -hmm. We try to hire in San Francisco. It's a lot easier that way to have people local. That makes sense. Uh, so we hold things called the GitHub, GitHub Drink Ups, which are the drinking part of a, what a traditional meetup would be, where we mm -hmm. just go to a bar and we say, hey, developers, we're going to be at this bar. We're buying everyone free beer, and you should show up and just hang out. And so we found a lot of our people that we've hired and gotten to know them through those, through Drink Ups. Mm. Interesting. So that's one great way that you can get out there. Another one is having open source. Okay. We've hired a lot of people who have written open source that we were already using before we hired them. And right. so that's one way that, I mean, there's no better code interview than already using their software, right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a big one is, are we using software that you've already written? Or do we know you as a contributor to software that we're using, et cetera? Uh, that, that's so important. Having open source, having code that's available out there for me to look at is, is so important because we don't do traditional interviews the way most people do them. We usually decide whether they're technically competent first, uh -huh. and then the interview is really just to make sure they're a good cultural fit. So, so we'll, talk about, we'll talk about technology and uh -huh. whatever they're doing during the interview, but, but there's no whiteboards, there's no riddles. It's really just figuring out whether they're passionate about what they're doing, whether uh -huh. they love talking about what they're doing, and, and do they, does it feel like they would be a good fit culturally through, through and that's really just identifying values. Do right. they value the same things as us? Uh -huh. Does it seem like they would fit within the, the culture and the, the framework that we've de designed for us that allows us to work really well, super efficiently? Are they going to be able to deal with that? Right. So, that's, so that, those are the things that we go on. So is it more important then to have, a, I guess, a resume that you would look at as opposed to having like good code out there that you can actually go and browse through before you come find me? I find resumes to be almost entirely useless. You send me a resume and I'll be like, congratulations. You send me code, <laughs> well, now I'm interested. Right. And, and that makes a lot of sense too because, I mean, I'm not going to put whatever issues I know I have into my resume. You know, but you you should yeah. be able to pick up any coding challenges that I have through my code, or at least some of them. Yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I don't care where you went to school. I don't care where you worked before. I don't care about anything except are you awesome at what you do? Mm -hmm. And a lot of that comes from probably half of us and possibly more of us don't have college degrees. Right. I don't have one. Chris doesn't have one. Um it's, it's more, uh, to us, it's more about what, do you, what can you accomplish? What are you capable of as opposed uh -huh. to what is your pedigree? We, right. have a, we have a very strong culture of just, are you, getting, are you getting shit done? If so, then you're awesome. And if you're not, <laughs> then, well, that's another story. And that's yeah. really what it's about. That's what it boils down to. Are awesome things happening or are they not? Are you a person I, capable of making awesome things happen? Well, if so, then you probably made awesome things happen before that I can go look at. And if right. not... And that's a much harder proposition for us. That that makes sense. It's interesting too. I've had this discussion with a few people over results based um, pay versus like hourly pay or whatever you know. Yeah. So instead of you know giving them money for their time, which I, I guess effectively you're doing, you're kind of in the middle. You know, you're like, yeah, you get a salary for working here, but yeah, it's or you know, are we getting the results? You know, are you worth yep. keeping? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I said two more questions. I have one more, and that is, is when, when are you going to write the book, GitHub, How We Owned Open Source? <laughs> well, it's, uh, I, w I would love to write a book like that someday. I don't know that I ever will. I don't know that I have it in me to write a full-length book. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> uh, one wonders. Yeah. One wonders. I, I, the reason I ask, I guess, is because there are a lot of lessons that I think you and Chris and some of the other guys at GitHub have learned or are learning that, that are interesting to us and, you know, who are on the outside. But, you know, I, I don't know that I know enough to ask you the right questions to bring those out. And I don't know that, uh, you know, these things become commonplace sort of to you. So, you, you know, you would think, oh, well, I need to talk about this or I should share this. And so it would be really interesting to just watch for a while. And, and you know, if I can't do that, then it would be really interesting for you to just write it from your point of view so that I can get that inside view that way and go, 
okay, so this is, you know, this is what he was thinking when this happened, and this is how they dealt with these issues. Yeah, I wish that I had kept a, a journal. I wish I was the kind of person that kept a journal, because mm-hmm. I often go back and I think about the conversations that I had in the beginning of when GitHub was starting, and I, I remember them a certain way, but human memory is so malleable and crappy that it's hard to know whether that was actually true. Yeah. And there's so much there's so much loss, so much interesting stuff that I'm sure I won't remember. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I would, you know, I would I would really love to write something that expounds upon everything about how we work, and I'm trying to do that in little pieces on my weblog. Yeah, I was reading through that. It's actually got some really really great stuff on there. Uh, if you're if you're listening, it's tom.preston-werner.com. Yeah, so that's right now. That's the best place to go if you want to to get a peek inside of some of the things that we do and how they came to be. Uh-huh. Uh, I also do a lot of presentations, conferences, and I talk some there about how the company works. There was one I just did at a conference called ACCU. Uh-huh. If you go to my weblog, there's a there's the video of that presentation called Optimizing for Happiness. That would be a good one to watch. That will tell you much more about the culture of the company and how we work. It's all about how how like you were asking, you know, what make, what allows us to hire really well. And in that I I talk about that specifically, which is investing in humans. Mm-hmm. Uh, instead of always just pinching pennies and saying it's it's simple stuff like uh, we well, if you get if you get a talking spot at a conference uh-huh. anywhere in the world, we will send you there. And uh-huh. not only will we send you there, we will send someone else in the company with you. Right. And it's the kind it's that kind of stuff which at most companies is unthinkable. Uh huh. That we just do all the time because it's about investing in, in people. People want to learn and be better and socialize and expand their networks and become better speakers and that kind of stuff. And all of those things benefit us as a company from having people who are, who are learning and going along that path and spreading the knowledge of Git and being present in uh-huh. developer communities as GitHub employees. All of those things are beneficial to us. And so we'll spend the money to, to send people there because it's an investment. It's an investment in that person. And people understand that. It, it, it creates just a tremendous amount of loyalty to the company because they know we respect them as individuals. We know that they know that we're willing to spend money on them, mm-hmm. which keeps them here longer, which, which uh, just makes me very happy because I love everyone that works here. And then, they, and then there's no reason for them to go looking for another job because they're really satisfied. They're doing excellent work. They're treated well. We're investing in them as humans and, and developers and everything. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's all about that. That's, that's kind of how what I think makes us different as a company is that we think about things that way. Yeah, and, you know, it's, it's interesting because that's, that's exactly why I did leave one company that I worked for. It was, well, I, I really would like to go to this conference and be involved. And it was, well, ho-hum, erg, well. And eventually well, I think what it came down to was um, he's brought up a couple of other things that we haven't given him. So if we don't give him this, he'll probably leave. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and it was that way with everything, you know, and it was like, look, you know, I just want, I want to go out, I want to be challenged, I want to write cool software, and, you know, and yeah, it, it just never happened, and so eventually I did leave. I mean, they did send me to RailsConf and RubyConf that year, but, you know, beyond that, it was, I mean, every little thing, I hated my job, and yeah, it was it was because they weren't willing to invest, they just wanted, you know, the developers to give, give, give. And it, it's shown, I think, I think they only have half of the developers that were there when I was there. And it's because those guys don't care. They just want to hold down a job. And, you know, anybody who was driven at all is gone. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing. And we recognize that from having worked in those environments. And we're trying to address it. I think it's similar to how with GitHub we're trying to lower the barrier to collaboration on open source at GitHub, the company, for the employees we're trying to lower the barrier for just kicking ass. Yeah. All right. I have one more question. How do you say your Twitter handle? <laughs> My Twitter handle is pronounced Mojambo. Mojambo. Okay. Yes. And, it, com- uh, it comes from, uh, it's, a, it's a sordid tale. It comes from a lunch in college uh, at the dining hall where I went to school. I went to college for two years and dropped out. We had this dining hall. And sometimes the lunches would be a little suspect. 
And uh -huh. one day we had a dessert, which was supposed to be flan, apparently. That's what it was <laughs> labeled, flan. <laughs> but this dessert had the texture and the and the it, uh, the substance of of pencil eraser the 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 old brown gummy ones. Did you, did you ever have those when you were a kid? The oh old yeah, brown gummy kind of erasers, right? Uh -huh. It basically had the texture and and feel of that. And I said, "There's no way this dessert is food." And I will prove that by carving a small elephant out of it. And so I carved a, a small kneeling elephant out of the, this dessert. And I said, behold, I have a sculpture made out of what they call food. And I took it home with me and I kept it and I needed a name for it, obviously. And so I, I chose something randomly African sounding, which apparently was Mojambo. Uh -huh. And then I started using that as my handle online because I don't, I don't remember. I don't remember. It was, that was like 12 <laughs> years ago, 13 years ago. But anyway, and he was Mojambo the Amber Elephant because this substance, when it dried, it turned uh -huh. sort of translucent and it looked like amber that you, from like Jurassic right. that you would find a mosquito in. That's what it looked like. And I still have it to this day. Yes, I have a 13-year-old piece of food carved like an elephant that is named Mojambo. Uh -huh. Or apparent food anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so now you know. Now you know my dark secret. All right, well... <laughs> uh, I think I think I need to wrap this up, and uh, unfortunately, now everybody's going to remember Jurassic Park and Amber Elephants <laughs> rather than all the good stuff that you shared. But uh, thanks for coming on the podcast; I really appreciate it. And yeah, absolutely, it's my pleasure. Yeah, you know there there are so many great companies out there doing stuff, you know, for the community, and GitHub's one of them. And you know, you you've been able to just bring in such great talent, and I really I, I really admire what you guys are doing, appreciate the product, and you know, hope that you continue to be successful. Thanks. That's all we're trying to do. All right. All right. Welcome back. Um, I I did get some feedback a little bit from somebody, and it, it really did make me think. I'm not I'm not in love with the the music that I have for my intro and outro, but uh, I'm not really sure what I'm looking for as far as. You know what I want to replace it. I want something kind of upbeat and edgy, but I'm not sure what that is. And and this is kind of not upbeat or edgy anyway. So um, if you have some suggestions of things that I can use that um, aren't copyrighted, that aren't going to get me in trouble for the copyright, then uh, I would really really appreciate uh, seeing those. Um, even if you can just refer me to a couple of websites where I can get uh, you know Creative Commons music and stuff. I, I found a few. And I just haven't found something that I really love yet. So, anyway, um, if you want to get in touch with me, you can. My phone number is 801 367 6164. Um, I'm available for Ruby on Rails Consulting. I am also available for coaching if you want uh, the coaching. And I'm working on getting things together so that I can um, so that I can put up my own Ruby on Rails course. Um, I'm thinking it's going to be about eight weeks. I'm planning on putting together a whole bunch of video content for it as well as written content and uh, I'm also planning on doing and recording some uh, webinars as part of that so overall you're gonna get a whole bunch of my time and uh, hopefully it will be something that you're looking for um, I haven't quite decided on the pricing yet um, but I'm probably looking at somewhere in the five to six hundred dollar range for an eight-week course which I think is a great deal so if if you're looking for that kind of uh, that kind of training, then uh, feel free to uh, email me and I'll, I'll get you the details as soon as I have them. Um, and I want to thank New Relic again for sponsoring the podca podcast and I want to thank Tom for coming on to the podcast and, and talking to me. Um, the the uh, interview actually went a little longer than I told him it would, but uh, there was just so much good stuff. And and so I just want to thank him again for coming on and sharing with us his, his experience and uh, Anyway, I'm just going to wrap this up and uh, remind you that writing the code is the easy part. <laughs>